So in our last lesson, we reviewed the first appearance of Satan in the world. First time we, we see him, we see him in, uh, in Genesis. And we said uh, last week, just as a form of review, that he was formerly, or originally rather, an angel who rebelled against God, was thrown down from his position. And uh, we read the scriptures last week, but we only find out about him from indirect references concerning him found in Isaiah and Ezekiel, as well as 1 Peter and Jude and Revelation. So uh, it'd be nice if there was a whole chapter or two about Satan, all the information one after another, but it doesn't work like that. And even the information about him, like large pieces of information, are kind of in a second prophecy mode, you know, kind of indirectly, that's how we find out. Uh, there are other mentions of him. Uh, they talk about his influence in the world for evil, but not about his origin, and not clearly what led to his, what led to his downfall. So in Genesis, all we have is an image of craftiness portrayed by his taking on the form of a snake and his opening question to Eve as she surveyed the tree of knowledge and good and evil. So that's kind of where we ended up last week. I want to remind you that what we talked about in the garden, there were two trees, one the tree of life, the other the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One of the interesting things is that one tree prepared Adam and Eve to eat of the other tree. In other words, if they didn't eat of one, they would get to eat of the other. If they didn't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would ultimately be allowed to eat of the tree of life. So the lesson that free will needed to learn was that obedience to God's laws result in eternal life. Some people say, where's that, where's that, you know, preachers always talk about that spiritual law, you know, uh, if you obey God, you live, if you disobey God, you die. Where's that written? Well, it's written right here. The original test of will. If you obey God, and the context was by not eating of the tree of, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, if you obey God in doing that, then you get to eat of the tree of life, which was, uh, uh, whether it was a tree or symbolic or whatever, uh, the idea uh, was that an individual would have eternal life. Okay, so that's last week. So Adam and Eve failed to learn that lesson, and in Genesis 3, we see the story of that failure, and I call it Eve's five mistakes. Eve's five mistakes. So we have to go back to the verse, chapter three, verse one, to pick up the beginning of the temptation. So in the beginning, you know, we, we read it last week, it says, uh, you know, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord has made, had made. So that was the introduction of Satan there, okay? So this week, we read uh, Genesis chapter three, verse one B, and it says, and he said to the woman, indeed has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So he begins not just with a question, but a subtle questioning of God's authority and good. It wasn't just like a, hey, you know, which way is, a, the, gar is the east garden here? You know, it, was a, it was a kind of a rhetorical question. And he's saying, well, has God really said this? Is he really serious about this command? The inference, of course, is that God has denied you something that could be good for you. Really? Did he say you should not do that, really? So the method is the same today. This is not a new method. You know, when you think about Moses writing this 1,500 years at least before Christ and writing about something that happened thousands of years before, isn't it amazing how the methodology of temptation hasn't changed uh, whatever? You know, the temptation to doubt that God really means what He says. Is God really going to condemn people? Is God really going to, you know, is God really going to do that? And the suggestion that what God forbids is actually good and pleasant for you. You know, this idea that you know, all God wants is to spoil our fun. Here we are, we're going to have some fun, and uh, you know, Christian people, all they want to do is you know, spoil our fun. That's why we don't like Christians, uh, they, they're spoilers. So here we see um, Eve's first mistake. So Eve's first mistake is that she compromised. She compromised with a rebel. Verse two, 
It says, the woman said to the serpent, I'll just stop there, I'll just stop there. Not only does Eve respond to a rebel sinner and try to reason with him, she becomes part of the rebellion by condescending to talk to him instead of rebuking him. She entered into the rebellion. Now maybe you know, not full bore, but she tolerated the serpent's challenge to the order of things and began immediately to take a weaker position. You know, it says in Jude 9 that Michael the archangel simply said to Satan, the Lord rebuke thee. He didn't get into it, look, you're an angel, I'm an angel, I'm going to talk to you angel to angel, you're wrong, but I'm being, no. He simply rebuked him. And this is what Eve should have done. She should have simply rebuked him and not gotten into a discussion with him. Mistake number two, she changed God's word. It's very subtle. Verse 2b, right? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So she attempts to correct the serpent's question, but in her answer you can see that the damage has already been done. In her answer she both added and subtracted from God's word. She makes God more restrictive and demanding that He really is, thus reinforcing what Satan was suggesting. Remember now, originally God said, you may freely eat. And when she repeated that, she just said, we may eat. In other words, God gave them full rights and full abundance. She said, well, we have access. See what I'm saying? It's very subtle. Eve said that you couldn't touch the tree, but God didn't restrict touching. To examine and to understand what is forbidden, that's okay. We do that all the time, don't we? It was to partake that was forbidden. A lot of times, you know, by studying or understanding what God forbids, kind of tells you the reasons why and so on and so forth. That's what we do in Bible class. That's what we do when we discuss with one another. You know, it's, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's not a sin to examine what sin is. The command was not to partake. So changing God's word to be too strict or too liberal is wrong. So we tend to think that being too strict is a safeguard against liberalism, but to change either way is a violation. Eve was not too liberal, she was too strict. And she played into Satan's hand. Mistake number three, she considered the offer. Verse four, the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. So had Eve rebuked Satan at this point, there we go, had Eve rebuked Satan at this point, the matter would have been closed and history much different. But note that the temptation is the same one that led to Satan's downfall. He said, you're going to, you're going to be like God. You, you know, what do you think the, knowledge, the truth of the knowledge and good and evil is all about? It's about you knowing and, and, and being smart and, and, and raising yourself up. You're going to be like God. Wasn't that Satan's downfall? It said he wanted to leave his position. Well, nobody ever leaves their position to go down. Only Jesus did that. Satan wanted to go up. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be even greater than God. So he just turns around and he offers the same type of temptation to the woman. And so Eve discusses the matter with Satan, thus considering his proposal. She's shopping. <laughs> She's shopping. She's looking. So 
you know, psychologically, what does that do? Well, that makes him bolder. You ever notice somebody trying to talk you into a bad thing, whatever it is, and you go, well, I don't know, oh, come on, come on, oh, and they find some more reason, yeah, yeah, but oh, and so and so's going to be there, and oh, it's going to be great, nobody's going to get hurt, and well, I don't know, I, I said I should be home, my dad said I should be home by 11, oh, yeah, oh, come on, come on, we can do it, two hours, we're there, we're back, it's done, it's good, you know, you notice, the, the, so long as you consider the thing, the person who's trying to reel you in gets bolder, that's exactly, Exactly what happens here. When you don't put down someone's evil idea or action, they become more ambitious and they double their attempt to win you over. So now Satan doesn't question the law, he actually accuses God of jealousy and dishonesty. First of all, he accuses God of being a liar. In other words, it isn't that you're going to die, it's that you're going to be like God. God didn't tell you the truth about the matter. And then he accuses God, so preposterous, of being jealous by saying, well, he lied to you because he just doesn't want you to have what he has. <laughs> so he makes the way of the curse the way of blessing. Isn't there something in the Bible that says you know, that we should curse those who make good evil and evil good. It's exactly what he does, exactly what he does. So God said that if they would refrain from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they could eat of the tree of life. So Satan tells them exactly the opposite. Yes, they would know good and evil, but it would not, uh, but it would not make them like God. That's not what God wanted for them. So in considering the offer, she was opening herself up for greater temptation at different levels. Now the attack is full bore because he attacks her at three different levels. First, there's the physical temptation. Remember she said, oh, she, she noticed that it was good for food and something that appealed to the senses and pleasure. He also appeals to her emotionally. She says, it's pleasant to the eyes. She realized, wow, this is pleasant to the eyes. Something beautiful aesthetically, something that moves you. How many times do people, I've heard people in my ministry career, people who have perhaps committed adultery, let's just say, and, and they say, but how can this be wrong because of the way I, I feel? It can't be wrong because it feels so so good, you know, and yet people judging just by their feelings and not by, you know, uh, by uh, objectively. And it's very difficult because once you become in, uh, um, uh, involved emotionally, it's very, very difficult. A lot of times major decisions in our lives are made more based on emotion than on thinking, right? I guess because we're human. Anyways, uh, so the physical, emotional, and of course spiritual temptation, she desired to be wise, an appeal to one's mind and intellect, an appeal to pride, to have a special insight, to have a special vision. So Satan goes after her at all three levels at the same time. John talks about the three areas of temptation in 1 John chapter 2, Verse 16, he says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. You see the parallel here? Right there, in Gen right at, at the beginning in Genesis, very first sin, very first temptation contained these three elements, and John is talking about the same, the lust of the flesh, the desire for sensuality, pleasure, the lust of the eyes, I want to know, the spiritual uh, temptation, pride. And Jesus faced exactly the same threefold temptations in the desert. Let's look at Luke, shall we? Luke chapter four, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. 
And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So do we see uh, what he has been uh, put through? Jesus has the same temptation. Uh, physical appetite, right? Attempted to the flesh, he was hungry. Second temptation, emotional desire. I'll give you all the world's kingdom, position. Third temptation, spiritual pride. I will give you, or rather, you can count on special protection. In other words, you can do what you want, God will protect you. Boy, that's, that's a lot of Christians fall easily to that temptation. You're a Christian, you know, I mean, you do whatever you want, God will take care of you. You're under grace. You're under grace. And some, some unfortunately, some Christians think because you're under grace, anything goes. They confuse grace with liberalism or liberality. You know? And yet, uh, even if we're under grace, we're still, uh, we're still under the, we're still under the uh, uh, necessity to obey God. Grace doesn't eliminate our uh, obeying God. The difference is, under the state of grace through Christ, I want to obey God. You know, the law could never do that for me. The law could never make me want to obey God. Under grace, I do want to obey God. So Eve was attacked at all three levels at once and she considered and pondered these things. Isn't it interesting that Jesus kind of goes through the same type of temptations? I make the parallel with Peter. You know, Peter denied him three times and then Jesus you know, made him confess his love to Jesus three times after on the shore. Eve was tempted in three areas, failed in all three. Jesus is tempted in the same three areas, succeeds in overcoming uh, the lure, if you wish. So what, what should she have done? Well, she should have either, either she should have stood firm with the armor of God, you know, Ephesians 6, 11. She should have rebuked him, made a firm stand not to compromise a stand based on the protection of God's armor, which is the word and the spirit, not a discussion, not a consideration or a negotiation, a firm stand, she should have done that. You know, James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I want you to understand something, you know, as Christians, it doesn't say destroy the devil. It doesn't say overcome the devil. It doesn't say argue with the devil and you know, win over the argument with the devil. It doesn't say that. It just says stand firm. Stand firm. Hold your position. It doesn't say charge, go into battle. It says stand firm. Because we don't have the power to, he's an angel. We don't have the power to, to beat him. Or, or she could have run away. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, you know, Paul says to young Timothy, flee from youthful lusts. You know, psychologists tell us that we have two basic reactions to danger, you know, right? Fly, uh, uh, fight or flee, right? We, stand, we fight or we, or we run away. And it depends on the circumstances and our assessment of the situation you know, what we choose. Sometimes you have to run away to fight another day, so to speak. Sometimes you know you're outnumbered, you, you have to save yourself. Sometimes the temptation is too great for our strength. Sometimes we may be misunderstood. It's better to run away than risk being seduced. I like this passage, the Old Testament, for whoever is joined with all the living, there is hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. What is the discretion is the better part of valor? Meaning you have to pick your fights. You have to know when to stand firm and when to back away. 
All right? Eve did neither of these. She didn't make a strong stand, nor did she run away for protection. She shocked, she admired, she considered, she said to herself the two words that bring so many of us down. Why not? It's usually the final argument, you know, after whoever's trying to, who, person, idea, temptation, you know, trying to reel you, that's usually the last, why not? Come on. The famous last words, right? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Mistake number four. She challenged, she challenged, she challenged too. Well, she, she challenged the Lord, she challenged the command. In Genesis chapter three, verse six b, it says, she took from its fruit and ate. You see, no matter what Satan said, no matter how attracted she was, no matter how mixed up the serpent made the situation, the bottom line is that with her own mouth, she had said that she understood what the instruction was from God. And the instruction was, don't eat the fruit. Even if she got kind of con, you know, con, confused there about, well, maybe I will be wise and maybe this will happen and hmm, I'm kind of... The instruction was fairly simple, wasn't it? Don't eat the fruit. And in the end, she reached out and she did exactly... Those of you who have children here, isn't that kind of how it works? Especially when they're very small, you, you tell them, you know, people who have small children are usually exhausted because they have to repeat the same thing 50 times a day. Don't do that. Don't hit your brother. Don't, you know, over and over and over. And then when you catch them doing it red-handed, they go, me? What? You know? <laughs> Don't eat the fruit. Here is where her will came into being. She chose to believe Satan regarding the situation rather than God. That's, that's, that's where her will came into operation. She liked his explanation of how things were more than what God said about how things really are. Now there was nothing in Eve that pushed her to sin. There was no weakness of the flesh like us. You know, our weakness built in. You know, we, we, we're born and we enter into a fallen world with a fallen nature, but she wasn't in a fallen world and she did not have a fallen nature. She had perfect free will and she simply chose to believe uh, Satan. She sinned because she chose to disregard God's word. Although her sin was more serious because she received a lot more than we have received, it wasn't any different than our sins today. We sin when we challenge God with our disobedience. All right, mistake number five. Mistake number five is she convinced Adam to sin. In verse 6c it says, and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. So as a prototype of all sinners, once Eve has sinned, she leads Adam to sin with her. You know, misery loves company. She gives from, she goes rather, from being God's defender to Satan's helper. Now there's so many questions about this particular action here. One question is, well, why didn't Adam, well, why did Adam eat? You know, and I mean, there's, because he loved her? I don't know. Because he wanted to share her punishment? I mean, this would make Adam kind of noble you know, in sinning. So this, this concept is not a biblical concept here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we don't know what went through his mind other than the fact that he was not deceived like the woman. And that's the charge against him. Yeah, she was deceived. She can say, the serpent, this angel, this powerful being you know, seduced me and I, I, I made the wrong decision. He deceived me. He lured me into it. But Adam had no such excuse. He was not deceived. The scriptures tell us he was not deceived. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 14. 
All we know is that he also chose to disobey God. He probably had the same arguments put to him by his wife rather than the serpent. Eve was deceived because Satan seduced her in the guise of a serpent. Adam was not deceived, he was convinced by the person he knew and loved. Again, still no excuse for him. He could have said, wait a minute, you have made a tragic mistake here, but we're going we're to stop the fire right here. We're going to draw the line right here and we're going to go to the Lord and we're going to say, Lord, something terrible has happened here and, and so on and so forth. You know, who knows? Who knows what might have happened? Another history. Uh, he may have thought that all was lost anyway. May have been discouraged. Who knows? We, we can only, this is only speculating. Either way, the result was disobedience to God. So I want you to note that the five mistakes of Eve are a preview of the stages that each of us go through when we fall to temptation. Number one, we fail to rebuke sin when it appears. Sinfulness is usually attractive and desirable. I mean, if it wasn't attractive and desirable, who would do it? You know, like if it was a sin to eat liver, I would be sinless. You understand what I'm saying, right? I would, be, I would be sinless. Because I've known people say, oh, wait a minute, you haven't eaten the liver the way I prepare it. You know, I, I got the onions and then I put some mushrooms and it's sautéed and I have my special sauce and, you know, and they give me all this stuff. You know, lure, it's good for you, you know, blah, 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 luring me in. And then I have one question. Okay, after you get rid of all that stuff, is there liver under there? Yeah, okay, I don't want any. Because the command in my brain is don't eat the liver. No liver ice cream, no liver watermelon, no liver flavored water, you know, no liver. Now I, what I'm afraid here is the only thing we're going to remember from this class is the liver, is the liver joke and <laughs> I get emails about recipes from liver from people watching online. <laughs> Anyways, let's remember the point. Sinfulness is usually attractive and desirable or powerful and our lack of quick and decisive action at its first appearance is usually our downfall. Usually, you know, the minute we go, hmm, what about that? Maybe just this one time. You know, very dangerous. Now, an effective rebuke requires three things. Number one, knowledge of what is truly good and evil. So we need to know the word. We need to know what is right and know what is wrong. And it's not always easy because there are a lot of things that are not specifically written in the Bible about immorality and so on and so forth that go on in the world. You know? So we, we can't go chapter and verse, you know, uh, thou shalt not kill, okay, that's an thou shalt not steal. You know? But there, you know, there are other sins or weaknesses and so on and so forth where we have to look for a principle that is expressed in the Bible rather than a command. Okay? So knowledge of what is really good and evil. Secondly, a conviction of our own position. No weenies. You know, I am adamant about no liver, okay? You can soften me up and you, know, you can drug me you know, and I can be half drugged you know, and they put the liver in front of me, uh-uh. I am absolutely convinced about that. No liver shall ever pass my lips, you understand? And then of course, an immediate response. Call a spade a spade. Wait a minute, is that liver under there? You said you were serving chicken, that don't look like chicken to me. You know, an immediate response. I'll give you another example, just to get away from my liver example here, because I think I'm going to ruin everybody's meal. <laughs> How about gossip? Because we all do it, okay? In one way or another, we all gossip. So, okay, so let me set the scene for you. you know? you're, you're two or three and you're talking about stuff and then all of a sudden says, hey, wait a minute, you know, I don't know if this is true or not. I, I got it you know, from so-and-so told me about so-and-so, but I think Janet, I'm not sure, but I think her husband left her. You know, I don't know, but I'm not sure. What? I think that's gossip, don't you? I mean, so what happens is we, we kind of surround that with some feel good, it's okay. Now, you know, I wouldn't tell this to anybody, but you, well, let me tell you something. 
it takes two for gossip. If it's just you that know the thing, it isn't gossip. It's you know the thing, or you suspect the thing, or you picked up some information on the thing, whatever it is, okay? But the minute another person enters the equation and you begin to transfer the information, even with all the caveats about, I'm only telling you and we, you know, I love Janet, you know, I would never do anything against Janet. You know, she likes liver, by the way. But anyways, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So it's easy to, all of us, and including me, it's easy to get sucked into that. But have you ever been in a situation like that where somebody says, oh, you know, come on guys, we're getting too close to gossip here. You know, let's, let's wait till we really know the situation. And then people, usually people go, yeah, that's true. Okay, okay, move on. But there's got to be somebody that'll just say, hey, this isn't right. What we're, what we're doing here is we can't be doing this. We can't be doing this. Okay. So we need knowledge of what is good and evil, conviction in our own position, and usually an immediate response. Secondly, five stages, compromising God's word. When we want to sin and still remain Christians, we simply change what God's word really says. That's all. Christian homosexuals, for example, they have their own theologians. They have their own Bible commentaries that explain away all the passages that condemn homosexuality. They have, pass they have, they have uh, 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 their own um, uh, scholars who will explain all that away. Usually the argument, if you're curious, is, um, uh, is the cultural argument. Uh, the cultural argument that says back in those days it was in the culture to, you know, not to be a homosexual. Culturally it was rejected. Today you know, we're much more enlightened, you know, so we don't accept that cultural argument anymore. The only problem with that is that all the prohibitions against homosexuality are usually smack in the middle of other prohibitions about stealing, alcoholism, uh, witchcraft, and so on and so forth. And, and, and the, the apostles say, and sins like these. Doesn't he mention all the other sins? All right. So uh, if we want to continue our bad habits, we simply block out the parts of the Bible that deal with them. Number three. So failure to rebuke, compromising, considering the pleasure of sin. When we don't rebuke sin right away, what we end up doing is trying it on for size. My wife knows we're in trouble. When I say, uh, they've come out with a new Chevy. Oh yeah? Yeah, the new Malibu, really, a complete design change, you know, saves on gas, you know, ding, 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 uh oh. I said, let's, let's go down and take a look. Let's go down to Hudeberg and take a look. You know? We're just going to look. She goes, ah, no, I'm sure. When she calls me by my French name, it's not good. But you know what I'm saying. We'll only go, we're just going to take a look. We're just going to take a look. I just want to try it. Isn't that the other argument that people do when they want you to do something which is wrong or wrong? Try it. How can you tell that it's right or wrong if you don't try it? So, don't go for a test drive if you're not going to buy. Because you're going to desire it and you're if you try it out. It's the salesman's basic approach to get you hooked. Why is it that every time you go to any showroom, the salesman said, well look, you know, who, you know, we're just talking here, we're buddies, right? You know, I know your name, you know my name, we're friends for life now. Ah, why don't you get in and try it out? No harm, no foul, it's free. Well, you know what they're doing, you're going to get in. <laughs> Smell that new car, boom, oh man. He wants you, she, he wants you to desire it. You can't desire it if you don't get a little taste, right? Number four, willful consent. That's the next step. Failure, we fail, you, we fail to rebuke it as sin. We start to compromise God's word. We, we, we want to get a little taste and then we consider, uh, then we consent to it. If we don't initially refuse to sin, we're going to eventually give in to it. There's only two ways to go. You do or you don't. And if you don't say no, then with time, uh, if you don't say no right away, uh, eventually you'll say yes. That's the thing. If you con continue to consider it and not say no right away, eventually you'll find a way to say yes. A lot of times what you're doing, what we all do, is we're, we're just giving us, ourselves some time to kind of, kind of 
squeeze out our conscience or give our conscience a reason why we're going to do this and it'll be all okay and so on and so forth. The trick is to decide ahead of time that you will say no. Then when you are faced with temptation, you won't weaken yourself by considering the pros and cons. You'll just, you'll just say, no, I've told you this before. You know, our daughter, our eldest daughter, Julia, you know, when she was in the Marines and, and uh, boys would ask her out in the Marines and she'd have the big talk with them. You know, she says, oh, a movie? For Friday night, a movie? Sure. You know, and, she said, as long as you know, I have my rules, you know, and the guys would say, oh yeah, what, what are your rules? Said, well, it's just three rules, three little quick rules. A, we're never going to have sex unless we're married. It, it's never going to happen. Not this night, not Friday, not ever. Uh, we're not going to go take drugs. That's, that's not just going to happen. Forget it. I'm not even going to try it. So don't, you know, and you'll never hurt me. You'll, you'll never lay a hand on me because I have a brother and he's a Marine and he'll take care of your business if you ever touch me. You know? But if you're good with that, I'm good, let's go. When are you picking me up? <laughs> when are you picking me up? Right, right, exactly. She knew in advance what she, how she would react to what took place and that's especially important for young people because younger people with less experience in dealing with sin, in their minds, in their minds it's like, yeah, I know what's right and I want to do what's right, but emotionally, not a lot of experience. And a lot of times emotionally, they get in over their heads, things move too quickly, and so their emotions take over their reason. So that's why it's good to know in advance what you're going to do. And then the last thing, then we're done, they start a club, we start a club. It's no fun to sin alone. And so the next step is always to find a sympathetic partner who will let you sin in peace or who will join you in that sin. When I was in Montreal, uh, preaching in Montreal, all the people who still smoked hung out together. You go to a potluck, all the smokers were together. The people who had that particular vice would find each other. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the, they, they, they would come in, they wouldn't know anybody in the church, but within two weeks they found out who the smokers were. Why? Because one smoker would never rebuke another smoker. So they'd go out, I got to go out. Oh, you're going outside? Yeah, between services. You know, oh, I'll join you. I had to put a sign down in the foyer saying, no smoking in the foyer. Imagine in a church you have to tell people, no smoking in the church building. Well, that's because they found a club. You know, uh, in Romans 1.32, Paul mentions this phenomena. He says that the, the uh, eventual state is that sinners who know that they're doing wrong encourage others to do wrong and they applaud them in their sins. And the reason they do that is that it helps justify their bad behavior. It can, if I can find another believer who behaves badly like me, I'm not so bad and I don't have to change. All right, so those are the the five stages to sin, Eve's five mistakes. Next time we get together, we'll look at the results. All righty, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.